Well, all right, let's open up our Bibles to the book of uh, 2 Peter, and uh, we want to take a look at these first four verses in chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1. Now, there is a, um, a gap of time between first and Second Peter of about maybe a year, maybe at the most two years, very short period of time in between the writing of these two letters. But even though they were written in close proximity with each other, there are great differences between these two letters. They they are completely different in their flavor. Now, you remember that in 1 Timothy, or 1 Peter rather, that the focus was that of encouragement. He's writing to a group of people. They're going through a very dark, difficult time in their life. And so he's writing to them, encouraging them, revealing to them how they can give glory and how God can, can use it in, in their life, even in the, the worst of times. Now, in 2 Peter, the focus is really that of warning, that, that Peter is beginning to pick up on the fact that there are heresies that are beginning to grow in the early church, that the early church is beginning to hold on to things that it really shouldn't be holding on to. Peter will eventually get to the subject of the second coming of Christ in chapter 3. You remember that when the disciples had asked Jesus concerning what will be the signs of your coming, that the thing that Christ continued to circle back to was that of deception. Beware that no man is able to deceive you. That the closer we get to the second coming of Christ, apparently uh, the more deception and the more heresy uh, will be prevalent. And so Peter now is seeing it begin to take form in the early church, and so he's warning the church. Now, when you look at 1 Peter, he's talking about dangers outside, dangers without, uh, the government, and, and these various forces of persecution. What we have in 2 Peter is really danger from within, that w- what's happening inside the assembly of the saints. What's being taught? What's being held on to? What, what is being promoted? So in 1 Peter, we have pain with a purpose. God has a purpose for the painful experiences in life. In 2 Peter, what we have is poison in the pew. And this is what he is speaking out against. Sidlow Baxter, in his book, Explore the Book, he said... Peter writes to ground his readers more firmly in the full knowledge of saving truth as it is in Christ Jesus, and thereby to reinforce their faith against the imperiling counterfeits of that time. I think we're going to discover that 2 Peter is going to be a very timely study for us. I think we look at the church, we see a lot of confusion right now. I think that we look at the culture we find ourselves in. There's a lot of confusion there. And Peter is going to draw our focus into what is truth and what, what, what is to be the main thing of the focus of, of the church. Years ago, there was a guy by the name of uh, James Fowler. Uh, he developed what was known as stages of, uh, of faith, stages of spiritual development within the faith of Christianity. And what he said was, is that first of all, he had stage one. Stage one was essentially uh, from birth to preschool. And of course, in, in that time period in human development, we understand that a preschooler has great difficulty in discerning between fact and, and uh, fantasy. Uh, they have imaginary friends. There's a monster that's under their bed, a monster in their closet. And Fowler was pointing out that whatever spiritual activity is going on in the life of a human being in these years, whether it's praying or worship or whatever, that much of this is being done in imitation of what they're seeing. They, they fold their hands and they bow their head when they pray because that's what they see their mom and dad do. Uh, they raise their hands, they close their eyes in worship because that's what they see others around them doing. That there really isn't much of authentic faith in those early years of human development. What we see in spiritual exercises is more imitation uh, than something that is genuine from the heart. Then, he said in early elementary school, the child is 
socialized in these, in these rituals, that um, they have maybe family devotion in their homes, uh, they're dropped off at the Sunday school, maybe, maybe the child goes to a Christian school where they have chapel and these kinds of things. And at this stage of human development, the child just believes that their worldview is the only worldview. They're being raised in this Christian home. There is this assumption that everybody is Christian and that the world is Christian. Now, after stage two comes stage three, and this is adolescence, where for the first time in the human experience now, you're starting to develop relationships outside of the family circle. You're spending time at a neighbor's house. Maybe you're having sleepover at a good friend's house. Uh, You find yourself having dinner with other families, and you begin to realize that there are other worldviews that are out there. You begin to realize that not everybody believes in Jesus. And and all of a sudden now, your your faith that you thought everybody believed in now, all of a sudden now you're experiencing this pushback. You're coming in contact with atheism and maybe different views of who Jesus was or what Jesus was. And Fowler points out that it is at this point that a person goes in one of two directions. That when you begin to realize that, okay, there are conflicts with my faith, we say God answers prayer. And yet we have plenty of examples in our church where maybe somebody was praying for a sick child and the child does not improve, but the child dies. Well, wait a minute. I thought that God answered prayer. We have stories of missionaries serving the Lord Jesus Christ, traveling to a foreign land, not to make money, not to become rich, but to just simply be a servant of Christ, and they, they might be killed in a, a very brutal way. What's up with that? I thought that God cared. I thought that God answered prayer. Now, Fowler points out that when you begin to become aware of contradictions in your faith, so to speak, or supposed contradictions, you can go in one of two directions. The one direction you can go is that you can just say, I'm not going to look at any of that. I'm not going to look at any of the problems in our faith. I am just going to believe what I am told. And you'll hear people frequently say, well, I believe this because this is what the rabbi has told me. This is what my priest has told me. This is what my pastor has told me. Fowler points out that most people in churches today never progress any farther than stage three where they just quietly sit in their pew and they just trust that the spiritual authority that is teaching them the Bible, they just trust that they are telling them truth. That's one direction that you can go. The other direction that you can go is on into stage four. And this is what we so oftentimes see in young adults, where they are not going to trust an outside authority to wrestle to to the ground the difficulties of their faith, they're going to solve these problems on their own. And they're going to make a diligent search to figure out if what their mother and father told them was actually true. And what happens in stage four is that they are trying to figure out the apparent contradictions of the faith. How is it that this God of love can tell Israel to destroy an entire people group, men, women, and children in the Old Testament? How is that possible? How is that not an obvious contradiction to this idea that God is love and God is kind and God takes care of humanity and these kinds of things? Now, Fowler points out that when you're in stage four, You can then go in one of two directions. And what we see most often, and we are beginning to see an increase in this, is that they just fall out of the faith. They just deconvert, as what we were talking about last time in our study in 1 1 Peter, that how many of us are aware of people who at one time in their life, if you were to ask them, do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you born again? Are you a follower of Christ? They would, have, they would have said, absolutely, I am. And now today, you ask them that same question. They don't want to have anything to do with the Lord. They don't want to have anything to do with biblical faith. They have deconverted. So Fowler says that at stage four, you can either deconvert or you can go into stage five. And he said, what stage five is, is that a person has come to understand what their place is in the universe. They have come to understand that there are two truths in the universe, that there is a God and I am not him.
And, and they, they understand that God is sovereign and God can do whatever it is that God wants to do. Very interesting that when you read the book of Job, that Job made this transition from stage four to stage five. Much of the book of Job, he's in stage four, isn't he? I don't know why this is happening. I don't know why this is going on. I've been serving God. I've been faithful. I don't understand why the bottom has dropped out of my life. Oh, how I wish God were here so I could have a conversation with him. And shazam, God shows up. And that was not a very pleasant conversation that Job had with God. And Job ends the book of Job by saying this. You can do anything. He's talking to God. No one can upset your plans. You ask, who is this muddying the water, ignorantly confusing the issue, second-guessing my purposes? I admit it. I was the one. I babbled about things far beyond me, wonders way over my head. You told me, listen, let me ask the questions. You give me the answers. I admit, I once lived by rumors of you. Now, I have it all firsthand. From my own eyes and ears, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I'll never do it again. I take back my words, and I repent in dust and ashes. You see, this is a man that understood that there are things that he's never going to comprehend on this side of the resurrection. God is greater. God is wiser. I am not God. Therefore, as Peter recommended at the end of 1 Peter, I'm going to submit my hand under the heavy hand of God. I'm going to submit my life under his hand, and I am just going to allow myself to be the servant, and he's going to be God. So what 2 Peter is going to provide us with is not only what we believe, but why we believe it. And Peter is going to move us on from stage three, where we're just listening to whatever it is that we're being told, and we're just going to comply, and we're going to follow, even though we don't understand why. Peter is going to be laying out for us the evidence and the reasoning behind our faith. Now, a very simple outline. Uh, chapter one, he's just encouraging spiritual maturity. Chapter two, he's condemning false teachers. He is going to say some very unkind things about false teachers. And then in chapter 3, he's going to be focusing on uh, the return of Christ. Well, let's notice how he begins here in verse 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Again, notice no mention of being pope. To those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, a heresy that was beginning to take shape in the early church, and it is going to be in various stages of evolution and development over the next one to two hundred years. It eventually will be confronted at the Council of Nicaea um, that, that there was this heresy trying to make the Lord Jesus Christ less than what he was. I mean, after all, didn't Jesus say, the Father is greater than I? And so there was this heresy at work trying to make the person and the work of Christ less than what he was. Now, I want you to notice that right out of the blocks, Peter is going to be banging away at heresy and false doctrine in the church. Notice we have two nouns here. We have God and we have Savior. Now, notice that these two nouns are connected by the Greek word chi, all right? So two, prop, uh, two, two nouns connected with the word chi. The reason why this is so important is one of the great guys in, in history that probably most of us have never heard of is a man by the name of Granville Sharp. Now, Granville Sharp, living in the 1600s in London, was an abolitionist. He was a, uh, a great proponent of bringing an end uh, to slavery. He had a desire to gather the 15,000 slaves in Britain at that time to repatriate them back into Africa. He wanted to build cities and factories. He wanted to build infrastructure. He wanted them to, uh, to be able to have a, um, a great opportunity uh, of succeeding. Uh, this, his desire to help the black slave 
uh, cost him personally. He was known in London as the protector of the Negro. He was, he was a wonderful human being. He was a wonderful disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he was also a, a, a Greek scholar. And he came up with what was known as Granville Sharp's Six Rules for New Testament Grammar. And first, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, specifically he dealt with in his first rule of grammar when he said, when you have two personal nouns connected with chi, the second noun is a further description of the first noun. So we have our God, chi, Savior Jesus Christ. What he is saying is, this is not talking about two people. It would be like a person saying to you, I'm looking forward to the visit of the great monarch and our queen, uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth II. All right? Now, upon hearing that, you would not think, you're, oh, they're talking about an unnamed great monarch and you're talking about Queen Elizabeth. No, that's not how you would interpret it. You would correctly interpret it, all right, our great monarch is Queen Elizabeth II. Queen Elizabeth II is our great monarch. And this is exactly what Peter is doing here. Peter is telling us is that the Savior Jesus Christ is a further description of our God. Our Savior Jesus Christ is our God. Our God is Jesus Christ. Kenneth Weiss, uh, the great uh, Greek scholar, he said, the expression God and our Savior is in a construction in the Greek text which demands that we translate our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The expression thus showing that Jesus Christ is the Christian's God. So right out of the blocks, Peter is telling us the Lord Jesus Christ is God. Now, there were, of course, two serious issues going on in the early church. You have heresy, number one, and you, of course, have the problem that we dealt with in 1 Peter, and that is that the Roman Empire is having a real problem with Christianity. Now, we might we might find that a little curious. Why is Rome so upset with Christianity? I mean, Rome, they're polytheistic. I mean, they don't, they don't care what God you worship. So why in the world are they so upset with the Christians? Well, you really have to go back to Julius Caesar. Now, as you're aware, Julius Caesar was assassinated. And after his assassination, there was a great struggle uh, as far as who's going to ascend to the throne. One of the people trying to ascend to the throne was a young man by the name of Octavian, who was the adopted son of Julius Caesar. He later on is named Augustus, and so he's Caesar Augustus of Luke chapter 2 fame. And after much bloodshed, much warfare, um, much mystery and intrigue, eventually Octavian ascends to the throne. Now, shortly after Octavian takes the throne, there is a comet that is seen in the night sky. Octavian tells the Roman Empire that that was none other than Julius Caesar ascending uh, to the throne room of the gods where he himself is God. Now, when you say that your father is God, you're a son, and you say that your father is God, well, that obviously is going to make you the son of God. And we find this all over Roman coinage where Augustus claims to be the son of God. Now, all of a sudden, you have got Christianity coming along saying, no, no, Caesar is not the son of God. Jesus Christ, the risen one, is the son of God. In the uh, early 1800s, there was this calendar inscription of Perrine uh, that was discovered, and on it, it had the actual birthday of Octavian. And it said something very interesting. He said, the birthday of the God Augustus was the beginning of the gospel for the world that came by reason of him. We have to understand everything that the church was saying about Jesus Christ is what the Roman government was saying about Caesar. He is the son of God. He is the savior. He is the good news that has come into the world. So we have to understand that the church was on a collision course with the Roman government from the very beginning. 
And so as we're going to see, Peter understands, we're going to see this shortly, Peter understands that he doesn't have much time left, and so Peter is taking the gloves off, and he is blasting heresy. He's going to be blasting the worship of Caesar himself. Now let's notice who he's writing to, to those who have obtained this like precious faith. Now, who are those? Well, we're told a little bit later on, chapter 3, verse 1, Beloved, now I write unto you this second time. And so what's going on here is that this is now a follow-up to 1 Peter. He's writing to the same audience. You go back to 1 Peter, that audience were those living in Asia Minor. You remember he took us around a clockwise motion around Asia Minor to these various provinces. So all of these believers in this area now, he is writing to the second time. Notice what he tells us about them here, that they have obtained like precious faith. Now that word obtained, it means that you have received something by divine will. That our salvation has not come to us by human effort. Our salvation has not come to us by our intelligence or our study or we have done a comparative religious study and we have figured out that Christianity is the truth. We have come to the saving knowledge based on his divine will. Our salvation is by his sovereign grace. You remember, it is the Lord's will that none would perish but all would come to the saving knowledge of Christ. Now, on the subject of grace, notice verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Now, again, Peter, being very concerned here with these false teachers, he is telling us what? That this grace and that this peace is going to be multiplied how? as we continue to gain knowledge. Now, this is very important. Notice that he doesn't say, well, we need to gain knowledge about Christ. Notice the wording is the knowledge of Christ. We are knowing him. Our great defense against false doctrine, our great defense against deception is to know Christ. That's why we go to the Gospels, and we read the Gospels over and over and over again, because in reading them, we're gaining a knowledge of him. We're gaining a knowledge. What what was important to him? What, What did he gravitate towards? What did he run away from? What was there that he appreciated? What did he hate? What did he love? You ever find yourself in a situation where somebody is telling you about something, uh, somebody, and what they're telling you is a lie, but you know the person, and you know the person so well that as they're telling you the story, you're thinking to yourself, hey, wait a minute, I, that, no, 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 that, that is impossible. I know the guy, all right? He would never say that. I know the guy. He would never do that. And so what we're going to find in Second Peter is we're going to find li- words like, like know and knowledge 16 times in three chapters, all right? So, so our great defense is knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. So when somebody comes along and says, well, God wants you to do this, and God wants you to do that, well, all you have to do is run it through the grid of what we know about Jesus Christ, and we can quickly discern, are they telling me something that would be pleasing to God? Are they telling me something that's ultimately going to draw me closer to the Lord? Or are they telling me something that if I follow, I'm going to end up going farther away from the Lord? Edwin Bloom, he tells us this about this word knowledge. He said, knowledge doesn't refer to a casual acquaintance. It means an exact, complete, and thorough knowledge. And the more that we grow in our knowledge of Christ, the greater the defense we're going to have. The more I know the genuine article, the least likely I'm going to be deceived by a cheap counterfeit or a cheap imitation, all right? I know him. I know who he is. I know what his values are. And so, therefore, that gives me a great advantage with being protected from Uh, deception. Now, notice what he says in in, uh, verse 3. He says, as his divine power has given us, and underscore this word, all things that pertain to life and godliness 
through the knowledge of him who has called us by glory and virtue. Now, God's plan is not simply to save a soul. God's plan is to save a soul and change a life. And I believe that there is no greater advertisement for the authenticity of Christianity than a changed life, right? When you see uh, somebody that was an axe murderer, right, and now they're a, a loving individual that serves other people, well, something of great significance has happened in that person's life. And somewhere along the line, we, we got this idea that God does the saving, and now somehow we're in charge of, of the changing. God has saved me, and now it's up to me and my effort to somehow become what God wants me to be. You need to read this verse very carefully. He tells us here that God has given us everything that we need to become what it is that God wants us to be. Let me introduce you to a guy. This guy is Chief Crowfoot. He was the chief of the Blackfoot Indian tribe in Canada. The Pacific Canadian Railway wanted to run a rail line across Blackfoot territory. And so they had offered them compensation, and Chief Crowfoot thought about it for a while, and eventually uh, he came to the bargaining table and he signed the contract to allow them to build their railway uh, through, his, uh, through his territory. And the railway was so appreciative that this did not turn into some great big hassle that they printed off a very nice certificate with gold leaf and all of this and had the chief's name on it. And this certificate allowed this man to ride any train, anywhere, anytime he wanted, free of charge. Now, what the chief did, and you can see it in this photograph here, is that he folded this beautiful certificate up, and he put it in this pouch, and he wore it around his neck as a trophy. Never once did he ever set foot on a train. Given a great blessing, given a, a, a great promise, and never once does he take advantage of it. And how many Christians are there that they have followed the same reasoning of Chief Crowfoot, where they have on their, their coffee table a beautiful Bible, a beautiful gold leaf Bible there, and yet they have all of the outward trappings of the promises of God, and yet they've never experienced the life-changing power of God. Now, what he is telling us here. And, and I love this, this translation. God has granted to us everything we need for life and godliness through knowing Christ and trusting his all-sufficient promises. Look, what Peter is telling us here is that God saves and God changes us. Now, what happens is, is that we develop a heart of unbelief. And, and we fall into legalism and these kinds of things. Very interesting what I have witnessed over my short lifetime. I look back at contemporary church history and I see during the 1960s, God was very merciful to the United States and revival came. And revival spilled into the 1970s and that's when I was introduced to Christ. And in the 1970s, 60s and 70s, there was a very simple and I, I would say childlike faith among us in our assemblies. It was a very simple faith. I mean, because we were simple, long hair, our bell-bottom pants. We knew that Jesus loved us. We loved him because he first loved us. That was about as deep as our theology got. And it was a wonderful time. It was a wonderful time for discipleship. It was a wonderful time to grow together in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the 80s came. It was very interesting that in the 80s that there was a, a move uh, to become a little bit more sophisticated. And, um, and psychology uh, began to gain uh, a, a foothold with, within the church. And all of a sudden then, uh, we began to believe that, well, for real serious problems, if you came to Christ and you had serious addiction problems and serious issues, that, that look, it was going to take more than prayer, the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit to get you on the right track. It was going to take, well, it was going to take a professional, a, a trained professional. 
And that was the beginning of us, I believe, stepping back away from the simple power that God is offering you and I. Now, is Peter lying to us or not? Peter is saying everything, everything you need for life and godliness. You need more life? You need more godliness in your life? Well, according to Peter, everything you need has already been given to us. Now, one of the men that I so appreciated that began to speak out against this was John MacArthur. I don't agree with John on every point of doctrine, but I certainly appreciate his great boldness in defending the power of the Word of God. And in 1990, 91, he wrote a book called uh, Christ, uh, Our, Our Sufficiency in Christ. And he said in part, he said, too many Christians have accepted the notion that our riches in Christ, including scripture, prayer, and the indwelling Holy Spirit, and all the other spiritual resources that we find in Christ, simply are not adequate to meet people's need. And what begins to develop is that we have a form of godliness, but we are denying the power thereof. How does this verse begin? As his divine power has given us all things, right? So you say to me, you come up to me, and you say to me, look, I've, I've tried all of that, and, uh, and it's just failed, and I've, I've not been able to live a changed life. Well, somebody uh, is lying, right? Because either Peter is lying or you're lying. I love what Alexander McLaren said. He said, we may have as much of God as we will. Christ puts the key of the treasure chamber into our hand, and he bids us to take all that we want. If a man is admitted into the vault of a bank and told to help himself, and he comes out with one cent, whose fault is it that he is poor? And so here is Peter telling us, everything you need for life and godliness has been given to you by his divine power. How often have we cried out, Lord, change me by your power? How often, how long has it been since we've cried to the Lord in our helpless state, God, change me, change my desires, change my focus, change my life. Take the word of God for what it says. Everything that you need to live a changed life has been given to you. Now notice how he closes this out in verse four. He says, by which we have been given have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you might be, you may be the partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Look, if you have an experience with the living God, according to Peter, what he's telling us here is that we are going to be changed. You remember what the writer of Hebrews closes out the letter by saying, Now, may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will. What did Paul say to the Philippians? Chapter 1, verse 6. Being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. You remember the Lord in uh, Genesis chapter 2. He, he, he does all of this marvelous work of creation. And he looks at it and he says, it's all good. See, that's what the Lord wants to do in your life. It's what the Lord wants to do in my life. The Lord wants to look at us at the end of this journey and say, oh, that's good. It's good. Let the Lord do that which he wants to do in your life and hear those wonderful words being pronounced over you. Oh, this is good. I love what Charles Spurgeon said. He said, the work of grace has its root in the divine goodness of the Father. It is planted in the self-denying goodness of the Son. And it is daily watered by the goodness of the Holy Spirit. It springs from good. It leads to good. And so is altogether good. That is God's will for your life. God's will for your life is that you would allow him to do his perfect and complete work in you. And all it takes is surrender. I, I heard this years ago as an example. Look, 
gravity is pushing down on all of us. All of us find ourselves under the heavy weight of gravity. But we go to an airport, and we get inside that airplane, and that airplane has the power to overcome gravity. We get in that airplane, and that airplane takes off. And, you know, you're looking out the window as you get to the end of that runway, and you're beginning now to increase your altitude. And these circles around, you see the expressway that's around the airport there, and you see those cars on the expressway, and they're getting smaller and smaller. All of those people, they're being held down by the weight of gravity. But you're not. You're not. Why? Because you got in the plane. And you let the plane just do its deal. And what Peter is telling you and I is that Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ is our Savior. God, the creator of the universe, is our Savior. And he has done everything to save you. And he is offering everything to you to change you. And if you get through this life and you call yourself a disciple of Christ and you have not lived a changed life, it is not God's fault. It is your fault because you have lived a life where you've had a form of godliness, went to church, maybe even read your Bible, did all of these spiritual things. But you never cried out in helplessness that God would change you by his power. You have the the tool of prayer, the word of God. You have the person of the Holy Spirit who loves you and wants to see you safely to the end of your journey. Submit yourself to God. Submit yourself to what the Lord wants to do. And allow him to change your life for his glory. Let's pray that it might be so. Father in heaven, Lord, I so thank you for the book of 1 Peter. I I thank you, Lord, that you not only tell us what to believe, but you are carefully laying out for us why we are to believe it. And how I thank you, Lord, that you give us grace not just to be saved. You give us grace to live a changed life. Father, I, I pray that you would so be at work in our lives that we would witness the life-changing power of Christ just transforming us. Lord, we're reminded of the disciples. Here they are, just arguing among themselves, being just consumed by their own selfishness. Which of them is going to be the greatest? Here they are, running out of fear from the enemy as Christ is being apprehended. And then, 50 days later, to see what these men have become in 50 days? Well, that's not humanly possible. That transformation, that change that took place in them is not humanly possible. And of course, we realize they weren't changed through human devices. They weren't changed by anger management classes. They were changed by the power of the living God. May that be duplicated in each of our lives as we just get in Christ and let him have the power that overrides every pressure that wants to just push us down. May we live that life where we're able to just mount up with eagle's wings and soar above what we once were. Lord, help us to submit to Christ. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.